Hey everyone, welcome back to the Going Scared Podcast. This is your host, Jessica Honiger, founder of the social impact fashion brand, Noonday Collection. Join me here every week for conversations on living lives of purpose by leaving comfort and going scared. Welcome back. I have missed you and I am excited to be back because we are kicking off a new series that we're calling Decide, Don't Slide living intentionally as life begins to normalize. Now, I know we are entering this new no man's land where life isn't like how it was, it's not like how it's going to be. We are edging out of our homes and into gathering again with friends. I even went and picked out outfits last weekend for some future events that I have. Imagine that. And it all brings up in me this question of, what do I wanna keep from how I've been living the last 15 months? And what are those things that I need to let go of? I think a lot of people have made a habit of hermiting, and I think it's time to go ahead and connect, get together with people. On the other hand, there's the calendar events are are coming back on again and i'm feeling a sense of gosh i've become a little bit of an introvert this past year and part of that's been really healthy and really good for me the pandemic brought many of us to our knees and it held a mirror up for our lives and how we lived them and so now as we start to see the semblance of normal life again let's ask ourselves what do we want to decide? How do, well, how do we want to live? What do we want to commit to? How do we want to choose? Because otherwise we're just going to drift along. We're gonna drift right back into some of the things and the ways and the habits of how we were living before. To kick off our series, I thought it'd be awesome to bring on a guest who speaks to careers. I think many people had new questions emerge around their careers over the last few months. And I just want any of you all who are stuck, who thought, man, I really want to make a move, but I just can't, or I want to make a move, but I don't know where. I wanted this conversation to be for you. So we have Ashley Stahl on the show. Ashley Stahl was a counterterrorism professional turned career coach now. Ashley is the author of the book, U-Turn, Get Unstuck, Discover Your Direction, Design Your Dream Career. And she is the author of a column every month in Forbes. If it's taken the pandemic for you to come to terms with the fact that you're not happy or fulfilled in your career, then this conversation is for you. I have to start with, you started off in counterterrorism. Okay, I am fascinated (laughs) by women especially in that career path. So I want to hear all about it. Break it all down. Take us behind the scenes. I mean, it's quite a career pivot to go from counterterrorism to career coach, but I wouldn't have it any other way. And I I grew up in a house where the news was always on. And from a really young age, I was super curious about what was happening in the world. And I remember my dad, you know, on Sundays, we would have family dinners with my extended family and he would just fight for better or for worse with my uncles who were on one side of the political aisle. He was on the other And I just had an opinion. And I remember going to college and going to the career services office and not really knowing what I was going to major in and walking in and saying, you know, what do I pick? And I didn't realize at the time that only 27% of people are operating with their degree right now. Most people don't use their college degree once they get. I'm surprised it's that high. Yeah, exactly. I mean, 27, like, so one out of four people, their degree is relevant for what they're doing. I think the fact that you have a degree, that you have committed to something, that you've put in work to something is valuable. But ultimately, there's so many different ways to get to where you really belong. And I remember when I walked into career services and I was operating on that belief that my major and my degree mattered a lot. And it does if you're going to be a doctor, for example. Right. But or an engineer, exactly. maybe like chemical engineering. Exactly. Or something. And she, she said all the things to me that, you know, were like, do what you love. And the, the three worded tirades, do what you love and the money is going to follow. Follow your passion. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember just leaving, feeling like I was on a treadmill to nowhere. You know, like I just, and what I didn't realize at that time, which I would realize later, is that 
there's a really big difference between being a consumer of something and a producer of that thing. And what I mean by that is I love politics. I love fashion. I love traveling. I love consuming those things. I love reading about them, being around them, practicing them in some way. Uh, but it doesn't mean I'm a good producer of those things. I'd be an awful politician. I'm way too emotional and sensitive, like definitely couldn't participate in the literal game of politics. Um, right. I'm not meant to be a fashion designer. And, you know, I, I just think with travel, there's a lot of different ways to misunderstand a love for tra travel and harness that into your right. career. I've seen people who join cruise lines for their career and then they realize like, I'm not really traveling. I'm on That's a ship. Yeah, travel. exactly. So I think there's a lot of misunderstandings and my journey into counterterrorism was one that I just followed what I was naturally good at, which was learning languages. I loved cultures and I didn't really understand who I was. And so I just picked something in the dark for the sake of it and ended up giving all of myself to that career because the only thing worse to me than, you know, not having a plan or having the wrong plan was ha having no plan at all. You know, so I just thought to myself, even if this isn't for me, at least I have something to talk about when I go to happy hour with people and they ask me what I'm doing. Or, you know, on a podcast exactly. right now, because it is very interesting. Yeah, <laughs> it is. I mean, even for me, like I have these weird flashbacks where I think back in that time and I'm like, I can't believe that was my life. So, I mean, for sure. So you graduate from college with what degree? I graduated with a bachelor's degree. I was a triple major in French government and history. And then my master's, I got two master's degrees after that. The first one was in national security, international relations focus. And then the second one was in spiritual psychology, which sometimes I kind of look back and I'm like, was that a causal thing? Like, did, did the national security master's kind of traumatize me? And then I went to spiritual psychology to heal from it. Like, I don't know. Right. That's <laughs> yeah. amazing. Okay. And then how do you go about finding a job in counterterrorism? Okay. So that's a whole thing. I graduated during the recession. So I was like really excited about my career. And then I fell off the cliff of the recession and I was on my parents' couch for way too long. And just like everyone, my bedroom became like a workout room, you know, after I came back from college. Right. And I bought into that belief after applying, applying, applying that I would just have to take what I could get, you know, that I just had to get my foot in the door. And I didn't realize then that those are just myths we tell ourselves to really play small. I mean, if you try to get your foot in the door, you better try to get the right job for you or else you're just pigeonholing yourself and giving away years mm -hmm. while you watch them hire for the role you actually wanted in the first place. And yet, why would they move you if they're happy with the work you're doing? Because it takes a lot of work to move someone over, you know? Mm -hmm. So I ended up taking a job at an ad agency because I, I just was stuck and I was applying for so long and I was making minimum wage. And about six months into my job, I started taking Arabic classes at UCLA and just telling myself, like, I still want to join the CIA. I still want to do something in the government. And there were these little moments that I write about in my book that were whispers that maybe that wasn't my forever. And I think this is a big deal. Some people, it, it's almost like socially the equivalent of what we're doing right now is saying to people, the first crush you ever have, marry them. That's like what we're doing with career. Yeah. The first job mm -hmm. you take, grow it. Versus, you know, who we are is such a complex organism. We are growing, we are moving, we are changing, we are constantly in transition. And life is a vehicle for self-discovery. And I think that that's a process. And so for me, uh, there are these whispers that were like, you know, this, you're too sensitive for national security, but I didn't want to listen to them. And even when I did, I would think to myself, well, I still want to experience this. And so anybody listening to this episode, I want to give them permission. Like if there's a path you want to experience, trust that, trust your desires, because it's not to mm. say you need to be chaotic and scattered, but like tune in to something that's really a wish of your heart. And for me, something in my soul just wanted to know what it would be like. It was like a curious experience. And so six months into my admin job, I emailed my college and I said, do you guys have a list of alumni who have graduated and moved to Washington, D.C.? And the benefit of that for me was anybody in D.C., it's a pretty two dimensional town. Like you're either working in politics or politics, you know. So yeah. I got this list back and I was so surprised. They sent me 2000 names and emails and phone numbers. And over the course of three months of my job, I would do my job from nine to five from 7 a.m. to you know 9 a.m., I would stay in the parking lot of my job and I would cold call all of these numbers. And I would put highlights and notes on who picked up, who didn't. I would try again. 
And this was the beginning of me learning that life is a numbers game. And eventually by doing this, you know, I, I fell on my face. I said the wrong thing. But out of those 2000 people, about 100 of them ended up seriously helping me out, giving me confidence to quit my job, move to D.C. And from there, I ended up getting three job offers in national security and accepted one running a program for the Pentagon. But what I will and I tripled my salary, which was a huge mind shift for me to realize, like, if you don't like where you are on Monday, you could change that by Friday. You know, like, that's what I did. I got this list of names mm -hmm. and it was not just 2000 names. It was 2000 conversations, 2000 possibilities, you know, right. and yeah, whenever you want to yeah. move your life forward, I think having a conversation with someone new can do that. And so that was kind of the beginning of my journey into to counterterrorism. But on the periphery of pursuing my career in national security, I learned how to job hunt. I learned how to talk to people. I learned how to be courageous. I learned how to follow my face. I learned what not to say. You know, there's so many things not to say when you're networking to get a job. And by doing that, I discovered my love for job hunting. I love it. I love possibilities. And that's what job hunting really is. And so I had a lot of friends ask me for help and say, you should be a career coach. And I remember thinking like, what does that even mean? Like, what is a career coach? And I'm, you know, 23, 24, like, I don't even have a career to base myself off of as a career coach. But I was so good at job hunting. I helped so many people in my network friends get job offers. And that led to the beginning of my business. So you're saying while you were making these 2000 calls for yourself, you kind of had enough conversations, which I love that we at Noonday have been doing some professional development training with um, a whole framework called Conversations for Action. And it's this whole idea that conversations lead to action. Like that is what, and if there's a breakdown, it's because there's a missing conversation. Mm. And so I love that, that really this starts with conversations and how often are we not having the right conversations. Yeah. And so you got on the phone, 2000 people. And so you, what you're saying is you ended up kind of making connections for your friends yeah. as well. That's what yeah, happened. And I ended up getting job offers for like a year to follow all of my networking after I took a job because I was just in a constant state of creating opportunities. So not only was I helping my friends rework their resume, network, but I was also literally handing them job interviews that I couldn't attend because I had accepted a job. And it was in that moment where I, I mean, I had, I had no idea at that time that I would go on to start a podcast or write a book or have a coaching practice or have online courses. Like this was really the result of me following what felt right. And I think that's the message I have for anybody listening is that your body is intelligent. You know, like our gut has, like you listen to my Ted talk, I talk about 200 million neurons. That's a cat or dog's brain size. And so I think there's such an intelligence to when our stomach sinks, when we have butterflies, when we feel a nudge, when we feel expansion, those are all breadcrumbs bringing us home to ourselves, which is why my book and a lot of the concepts that I use in my work is rooted in this idea of making a U-turn, where instead of driving down the road and going back the way you came, you drive down the road of your life and you come back to yourself, which I think we really deviate from throughout our lives by getting caught in the noise of who we think we should be. Okay. So you're at this job in mm -hmm. DC and how long were you there? And like, when did you kind of go, eh, cause I mean, usually career, usually that, that is a very clear career mm -hmm. path. You go down. I mean, if you're going to be in counterterrorism, you, you have to work your way yeah. through yeah. that. Up to the yeah, top. nothing loves rank and order quite like working in the Department of Defense and with the military. That is definitely a place where you yes. work your way up step by step. Um, and even then, I kind of sidestepped because I came in as a defense contractor, which is when, you know, for the, those who don't know, it's when the government pays a private company to do a project for five years that requires a full time staff um, or even 10 years or three years. I was on a really long term contract. And the reason government does that is because obviously they need to pay pensions and all sorts of long-term commitments to their employees. And it's an easier way to get into the government. And the only difference between me and anybody else in the Pentagon was I had a pink badge and they had a white badge. So we were working next to each other. It was really essentially that job. So I did that work for two and a half years. I was in national security, but on my first day, I already knew something was off and that I didn't make my way into the right place. And I even opened up my book talking about my first day because my book is ultimately an 11-step roadmap to help people discover their career path. And 
So I figured it would be right to open up to that moment that I had when I walked into the Pentagon chapter one and realized, oh no, I just chose the wrong path. And it's a blessing that that happened for me early in, because I think a lot of people, you know, it's like celebrities like Britney Spears, how she shaved her head and all these celebrities kind of have these breakdowns. I think that's because we set goals. We think they're going to make us feel a certain way. We chase that feeling. And then the goal doesn't feel that way. And we have a breakdown because we put our whole life into this feeling that's not there. And I think that's what happened for me, but I'm lucky I got a shortcut and I was able to reach this alleged goal that I thought was so deeply true for me early on. And I was able to say, oh, wait, like this thing that I put all my time into isn't for me after all. So from there, Mm -hmm. I started putting the pieces into place and starting my career coaching practice. I love how you say to treat your career as an experiment. I think that's a really good shift. I just found a journal entry that I wrote. I was going on a vacation with my, I have tweens and teens now, and I was going on vacation with them and I was needing to access some grace and compassion for this age. And so I went back through all of my old journals (laughs) And I found this journal. I do not even remember writing this down. But when I was 21 years old, I had just graduated and I wrote, there are big dreams and small dreams. My big dream is to be involved in motivating others to help their I nevers become their Mm -hmm. I wills. I want to give speeches advocating for something important to me, work for an organization I believe in for a cause I believe in. I want to be lowly and help the lowly, affect change, redeem broken places. Well, let me tell you, in the 15 years following that, I went to be a midwife in Bolivia. (laughs) I led Thai bow classes in Guatemala. I got a master's in education. I got my real estate license. I taught third grade uh, English class. I sold wedding china and jewelry at a high-end boutique. I started flipping houses. Like It wasn't until 15 years after that where I can look at that statement that I made and go, oh my gosh starting Noonday Collection. It's a social impact business. I have I do give speeches all the time. I motivate others. Like That's my job is now to motivate others and to redeem broken places and to affect change. And so it was really, honestly, I was floored reading this statement because I don't remember it. It wasn't like, I'm going to manifest my dreams. I was just kind of processing. Mm-hmm. And I think it's important that people see that kind of finding your way is an experiment. So I wanted you to break that idea down for us a little bit because I think that kind of helps people exhale a little bit to think of career as an experiment. Yeah, I love your stories and like the things that you've done. And I remember seeing that about you before we hopped on this episode and just thought like, like, wow, this is so in the vein of how I've lived my life and it's served me in so many ways. It's not to say for anybody listening that they need to go all the way to Bolivia or the Pentagon to find themselves and get these answers. But I do think the willingness to get radically honest with yourself about where you are, not where you want to be, not what you wish it was, but where you are is the beginning to transformation and true change in your career and real fulfillment. I think, you know, even in my TED Talk or any work that I've done, I love asking the question of what do you know that you wish you didn't know? And I love that question because I think in any given moment, a lot of people know something about their life or about what they want and they wish it wasn't true because if they really face that, it causes them to unravel their life in some way. Mm -hmm. But the courage to do that is so necessary because if you don't allow yourself to face the truth of where you are, you stay in, you know, what I think Thoreau had called, you know, most men and obviously I would add women live lives of silent desperation, you know? And Mm -hmm. I so believe that. I think a lot of people are stuck in a lot of grief because they're not willing to face the truth, face the inconvenient, face the pain. And that's the thing is that who you are always wins. Like, that little whisper of who you are is always going to shine through. So whether you want it to shine through this year or in five years, if you're doing something that doesn't actually suit you, if you're being someone that isn't actually who you are, eventually the pain of that is going to become bigger than your fear of the unknown. Eventually that will force you into change. So it's really a matter of, do you want to rip the bandaid off and cry this year? Or do you want to rip the bandaid off in five years and cry then? And I'm just about living Mm. your life now and facing Mm. the truth now. I'm curious how have you seen the pandemic change people's perspectives in regards to their career? Because I think it ripped some Band-Aids off, you know? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) 
I, you know, whenever somebody's fired or laid off, I, I, I have a lot of compassion. I get that that's really painful and can be very distressing from a security standpoint. There's also something to be celebrated because usually if you're fired, it really is the world saying to you, you're working in a skill set that isn't your core skill set. And in my book, I go through the 10 core skill sets I think exist in the workforce, which we could totally get into. But I think that those are really key to knowing who you are and where you have value in the workforce. Um, So I would say as far as the pandemic goes, a lot of people have gone one of two paths. Number one, something changed in their work environment, you know, whether it was the simplicity of just going remote or they were laid off or their hours changed or, you know, their company's restructuring and they're constantly afraid of their job. That kind of anxiety can be so distressing. So some people are forced to think about, is this actually what I want to be doing? This feels really unstable. Do I actually want this anyway? Does, Does it make sense for me to stick around? And I think what it's also done is burnt a lot of people out. I mean, we have research right now that nine out of 10 people feel burnt out and almost nine out of 10 as well, uh, on average, are working an extra hour per day, Monday through Friday, which is really just during just the during the pandemic. People in 2020 worked more than they've ever worked. They replaced their commute with work hours. And right. that equates to a small part-time job on the side that they just added. You know, it's interesting. I feel there are different parts of me. There's this part of me that has really not burnt out because I have been grounded. I, I traveled to eight countries in 2019. And so I went into 220 going, oh my gosh, I like I was planning on only going to one country. I was going to work from home for two days. That was my big aha meeting with a life coach. He was like, you have got to give yourself permission to work from home. I was like, I'm going to work from home in 2020 yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to travel you less. Got like that. Those are my goals going into 2020. <laughs> so I mean, so in some ways, you know, I'm rested, but in other ways, of course, I'm totally drained. And I, I mean, we're still all working from home and that's, I, I'm such a collaborative person, but I have seen that other side where there's no boundaries now and there's no like water cooler breaks and there's no, I'm getting on an airplane today. And that means I'm going to have uninterrupted time of, uh, you know, no internet. I'm just going to like do use my email or whatever. And so I do find that it, I think it varies by sort of the season of life you're in, where you're mm-hmm. at with how this has impacted you. I'm curious, do you feel like people have become more open to change because of it? Because I would think as a career coach, at the beginning, of course, there's fear. Everyone thought they were going to lose their jobs. I mean, shoot, that's all the conversations we were having was like, are we going to have to lay off everyone? We actually didn't have to lay anyone off. But um, but yeah, what have you seen as far as attitudes? Yeah. Well, I think when people are burnt out, it's you're, there's some science to that. And according to research, if you've been burnt out long enough, you're literally working from a different brain. And that's why everything feels harder. It's not just harder because you're tired. It's harder because your brain isn't functioning the same way it was functioning when you weren't burnt out. Mm. And so it's super important to get yourself to a place where – you are able to be honest about where you are with your well-being before you even make a change. And that might look like needing Mm. to have a conversation with your boss about what kind of work you have on deck and asking for their help to reprioritize. I did a really good conversation with Carter Cast on my show, The U-Turn Podcast. I think he had talked about, like he was the former CEO of walmart.com and he talked about how he received it well when people would ask his help to kind of reprioritize their workload. I think there's an art to that. Um, And if you're not in the right job, that's going to be viscerally clear because if you're burnt out and you're lower on energy and you're working out of a different brain and you don't really feel connected to what you do, I think life is just overhauling you to make a change. And so I think a lot of people are in that position. There's also some disconnect Mm. with different rises of technology in the wake of the pandemic. I mean, the first thing is promotions are no longer going to be based on likability. We're going to continue to see a rise in apps that anonymously team members will rate each other. And promotions Mm. are going to be database. They're going to be data centric. Like how was this person's rating? You know, were they contributing in a way that's worth the raise or the promotion? So we're going to kind of let go of those days where we could schmooze in the hallway. And whether we were working super hard or not, we would get that you know, annual raise. And I think those days are coming to an end. Mm. You know, it's interesting. 
I haven't said this publicly yet, but I can now, but we just got voted best place to work in the direct oh sales industry. Oh my gosh, congratulations. And that's by our that's by our team. That you know, it was a survey, it's data driven. And so it was it's our so we got the highest employee engagement scores that we've ever gotten during the pandemic. And I think that's because we were radically transparent and we are mission oriented. And so it, it, it's just brought everyone together around the mission and our team is so collaborative and so for one another. But I love what you're saying about being able to have these conversations yeah. because I'm thinking, you know, the reason we're, we're we, this is launching a new series today, my convo with you. So it's called Decide, Don't Slide. So what we're talking about is, you know, life is going to slowly start getting back to quote unquote normal again. You know, it already is. People are getting vaccinated. You know, we're looking over the next few months and we're thinking we're going to be some, some people are going to be saying time to come back to the workplace. Some people are going to be saying, okay, we're going to actually make some of these changes permanent and you can, you're going to work from home two days a week, but then I need you in three days a week. Um, But we're, what I want is an intentionality before these changes start to happen, what do you want? Because if you don't decide now, you're just going to mm-hmm. slide. You're just going to slide back into the overwork, the crazy, the the all of those things. And so what do you feel like – what are you thinking in your industry – how are things going to quote unquote move back? You gave one example. You think things uh, that promotions are going to be more data based. What are some of those other changes? And then what do we do now to decide instead of just sliding back into that? Yeah, life? there's a lot around the future of work. Um, obviously, cybersecurity has been like a huge issue that companies are facing. And I think that cyber attacks Microsoft had quoted, they had quintupled during the mm. pandemic because there weren't those secure internet connections that companies pay to have at their firm. And as a result, with employees working from a looser connection on Wi-Fi at their home, we're seeing a lot more like LinkedIn messages suggesting that they have a business deal with you and click here. We're seeing some more confusing Mm -hmm. emails, text messages, fake lawsuits that, you know, threaten people and they need to pay a check to make it go away. I mean, we're, we're just going to see more cybersecurity and threats and, um, and it's going to show up as, um, ne- necessary for employees to be educating themselves, you know, and that's something that I'm going to see a lot more of with different companies, you know, kind of putting that on their staff. I also think there's more competition when it comes to applying for jobs online. And it's all the more important that, you know, you are networking because in the UK, I think there was an average of like 300 applications for a desirable job opening. And it skyrocketed to like 4,200 because they removed the location on the job. Mm, Um, Right. That's true. So there's more competition there. Um, I would argue that this is a really good future ahead for top performers. Um, The ones that, you know, uh, the company can't afford to lay off, like they, even though they can't afford to support them, they can't afford to live without them either. Um, I just think that we're entering a really good market for top talent because with times of great distress comes great innovation. And I think people are going Mm. to keep seeing that. Okay, so I want to ask you about because I'm just imagining. I want to put this gracefully. Um, just that procrastinator, that person who they are stuck in a riptide, is what I call it. You know, we went to Oregon last summer. I had no idea you couldn't really swim in the ocean mm. because everywhere it's like morning riptide, and it's basically like you get into the ocean and you just get stuck in this tide, and it just is silently sort of white, mm-hmm. you know swishes you in and you can't get mm-hmm. out. And I think about that a lot with mindsets, these stuck mindsets. Yeah. It's like just this it's just you're stuck in it. And so I'm imagining the person that, you know, their life has been radically shifted because of the pandemic and they thought this is the time. Finally, finally I'm going to going to make that shift. I'm going to leave that career. I'm going to start that mm-hmm. thing that I really wanted to start but they're in the riptide in their minds. What what are those obstacles? And then you give us the next steps because that is what your book is all about. Yeah. I mean, I could talk about this forever. And I'm even just tempted to say one area that I didn't mention in your previous question about the changes is work from home and parents and navigating kids. Mm. Um, we saw unprecedented numbers. I believe it was 25% of mothers who quit their job and they're not sure whether they're coming back because of yeah. childcare. And so- And I I totally get this question about like, what do people do when they're swept by a wave and they don't feel motivated and they 
don't feel connected to themselves. Um, and even recently, I saw some data that Yelp had said that 163 thousand businesses closed due to COVID and almost 60% of those will be closed permanently. So I understand Mm. that things have really changed. And I think when the tidal wave comes in, your reference kind of reminds me of of clinical depression. I think Mm. in, in life, we kind of get hit by little waves and it's kind of like the tide comes in and it goes back out. That's when you're just feeling sadness or grief or loss. But when you're in depression, it kind of, I think, feels for people like the wave just comes in and it never goes back down. Mm. And for anybody who's feeling that the first order of business is to come home to yourself. And that's really what making a U-turn and my book called U-turn Y-O-U is all about. And my subtitle being get unstuck, discover your direction, design your dream career is really intentional because if you're stuck, like you, you're, you're not actually stuck. It's just your thinking that is. And I think what mm. frees up your energy as a first step is to maybe try an exercise, like grab a piece of paper and write down on the list of people uh, a list of people places things that make you feel, your- feel yourself like in my case the ocean always makes me feel more myself i just feel so alive mm-hmm. when i'm by the water um i guess it makes sense it's like we're 70% water so it's like the inner outer <laughs> reality and the oneness of the water but i um i feel really connected to the ocean i feel really connected to certain friends i have a lot of good girlfriends there's a couple of them that for whatever reason no matter how much fun i have with all my friends these two it's like wow whenever i see them i feel more myself again and mm. that is so priceless um there's places that i'll travel but since you know we're in a pandemic where travel isn't as easy sometimes um but i'll sometimes i would go to paris if i could afford to do that or take some time off And I would always come back because here's the thing, happiness leaks over and so does misery. So if you're miserable from nine to five, obviously it's really hard to turn on a happy switch at five. Um, But I think so is the case with self-connection. So if you can get that list of people, places, things that you love and start making space to go do those things. And even for me, like dance classes, I start to feel more myself. I start to get more inspired. My tolerance for anything less than me starts to go down and I start to make it more non-negotiable. Like, oh, I'm not going to do that. I'm not willing to do that. I need to set a boundary with that. I need to have this conversation because suddenly when I reconnect myself and I go off of that list, it starts to feel really good to be me again. And so that's Mm. the first step. Um, And another step I would say is, you know, the argument of my book and really of my work, whether it's my podcast or my book or anything is don't do what you love, do what you are. And my work with people is really helping them answer that question of who am I? And what does that mean for my career path and options? And, you know, like I was saying, the difference between consumption and production, like loving movies, but that doesn't mean you're supposed to be a film producer. Um, Realizing that your interests matter, but they're secondary to where you're gifted and where you're skilled. And so in chapter two of my book, I go through those 10 core skill sets, which with which if it's helpful, we could go through some of those. Um, those are key because when you know what your zone of genius is, you're able to look for jobs and titles and conversations that lead you to harness that core skill set. And when you know what your core skill set is, that's what you carry with you throughout your career. And a lot of people who are low energy are just low on purpose, you know? And if you give Mm. them a sense of connection to what they're doing, if they feel like they're capable of what they're doing, if they feel inspired by what they're doing, things change for them. And so that's really what my work is about. And happy to go through those if you're down for it. Yeah, do it. All right. I love these for, especially for the note takers. Um, So the first one is innovation. This core skill set is for the creative, visionary, self starter, problem solver. It can be the intrapreneur, you know, the creative, solution driven person within a company, or it can be the entrepreneur, the creator of the company. And usually that comes down to, um, I don't know, like your relationship to freedom and financial security. Um, people who, I find that the entrepreneurs, they feel a visceral pain if they don't have all out freedom. I'm talking like freedom to create when they want to create like when they create, what they create, the ideas that they're behind. Um, that to me is an entrepreneur. The intrapreneurs, they don't need to be the full vision behind the idea, but they want the autonomy and the, the say in the idea to, to sketch it with someone and to create it and bring it to life. Mm. Um, and then financial security, obviously the innovation skill set. You know, you're usually the entrepreneur if you have a looser relationship to financial risk than the intrapreneur. 
Um, and then the second skill set is building. This skill set could be quite literal or it could be more of a metaphor. So the building skill set could be, you know, like a construction worker or it could be someone who's building a website. It's, it's also an energy that these skill sets require. Um, the third one is words. This is my core skill set and why I wrote a book and have a show and all of these things just like you. You know, this is where I make money. This is where I make impact. This is where I'm most inspired. This is where I'm most skilled. So hmm. anyone who's read my book and messaged me on Instagram, they've said like, wow, you have such a poetry to how you talk. And I'm so, I feel so seen when they say that because I really feel mm. like my book is just a place for me to be me. And that's mm, I love what that. I want for everyone, you know? Um, so yeah, words. And it's really important, I think, with this skill set and really with any of them to figure out, are you an introvert or are you an extrovert? Because if you're an introvert, and let's say you're the words course skill set like me, then I'm going to be a writer, which I am, and I'm hiding behind my laptop a lot of the day. Um, if you're an extrovert, the way you're going to express your skill set of words is going to look a lot more external, like a business development, sales, real estate agent sort of person. Um, there's many different ways that words can look. You can be a, you know, editor in chief of a website where you've got a big team and you're managing a lot of people. It's it's all of that kind of stuff. Um, Skill set number four is motion. So this is people who are on their feet. This can be, you know, tour guides. It could be fitness trainers. It really is a skill to be able to be out and about and on your feet all day. And then the fifth skill set is service. And this is for the humanitarian, the helper. I feel like you have some of this for sure, Jessica, like service, service, service. Um, and, and this is somebody who is just really nurturing and wants to help. I think that the shadow of this one is just to make sure, like, are you actually a helper, supporter, nurturer, or do you have some sort of trauma in your life where it's not that you, you know, value service and have a skill with service is that you force yourself to be good at service because maybe your family unit required you to be people pleasing or going with the grain in some way. So I think the service skill set requires that, that sort of reflection. Um, and then number six is coordination. So, you know, the project managers, the operations people. Number seven is analysis. So, you know, this one can be confused with words. You know, words people will think, oh, this job has a lot of writing. But it's like, no, if that's a research analyst, it's more about an analysis. It's not about words. You're not writing poetry. You're mm -hmm. analyzing. Um, and I think it's important to note that you could be the same job in different skill sets. Like a psychologist that's leading with the words core skill set Maybe she's very healing because of how she puts her words together and helps people like kind of like my book and my intention there versus a psychologist who's great with analysis. They're more analyzing patterns and maybe their delivery isn't poetic or healing, but the information is really insightful, if that makes sense. Hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's a number eight, which is the number crunchers, just numbers. Number nine is technology. So that could be artificial intelligence. Uh, creators, IT whizzes, and then number 10 could be beauty, which is the people who make art of the world around them. This could be jewelry designers. This could be um, hair stylists. This could be musicians. It's, it's just all about beauty. So these all could look different. They all lend themselves to many different types of jobs. Um, but these 10 core skill sets, I think everybody leads with one. And even if you relate to two or three of them, it's really mm. about where am I truly gifted? Mm. <laughs> this is getting me thinking because I do relate. I mean, I relate to a lot of them, but I have created a life. I mean, I am an entrepreneur and I have kind of created a space for me to get to experiment. And that does go back to this idea to make your career an experiment. So what do you suggest to people that, you know, once they sort of identify um, sort of their core, what do you do with that? What's next? Yeah, I would say clarity comes from conversations like we talked about. So once you kind of know your core skill set, start thinking to yourself, who do I know that's residing in this core skill set? You know, like who, who can I connect with? Who can I ask about? Who can I have a conversation with to understand how this core skill set is showing up in their life? So let's say your core skill set is um, technology and, you know, you realize like, wow, I really want to talk to people in the artificial intelligence world, like do some research, find some people, have some conversations. Conversations will always move you forward from a clarity standpoint. 
know that there's a lot of options and this is where your career gets to be an experiment. There's no one path. There's no one answer. There's many paths and different versions of happiness and fulfillment. So it's really about you figuring out which path do you want to start with and holding it lightly. Because when you hold your career heavily, I think you put yourself in paralysis and you don't give yourself permission to actually figure out who you are. And I don't know, this kind of reminds me of a sign I saw at Pixar's offices a while back. The sign on the wall said, fail faster. And Mm -hmm. it's it's just so true, you know, with your career. It's like, try something on, give yourself permission for it to not be for you, move on. And that is- I love that. (laughs) I'm sure you're an entrepreneur. You've got to have so much (laughs) stuff you've tried on. I got lots of failure. I got- I got a resume of failure. Um, Oh, gosh. You know what? I want us to leave with that because I think that that is so powerful if people feel like they're in that stuck place. Instead, it's like I feel like instead just say, hey, you know what? You've given yourself permission to try something. It's not you. This isn't where you're going to be the most successful. And so give yourself permission to start looking for the next thing. And that all starts with conversations. I mean, two thousand people you got on the phone with. That is not messing around. I want to tell that to my ambassadors. As a matter of fact, I'm going (laughs) to get on a Facebook live with them because they can often be like, I've asked everyone to host trunk shows and everyone's saying, how many is everyone? (laughs) How many is everyone? And whenever you start hearing yourself make declarations, like everyone always, never, that is a sign that you're telling yourself stories. So I think that is so powerful. I love that. I love that so much. And you were so young and it was during the recession and it would have been easy to just stay in, stay in your, your home bedroom gym, you know? (laughs) Sounds like you have nice parents that maybe would have let you totally. do that a little longer than you should have, yeah, you know? Yeah, they didn't even want me to go anywhere. And honestly, right? I'm so happy that I, you know, like you made a really good point as we're closing is like, whenever I see somebody really successful and whatever success means for them, like happy, fulfilled, financially successful, whatever, spiritually, I always just think to myself like, wow, that person has a really nice conversation going on in their head about failure. Like, They're not making Mm. failure mean they need to stop. They're not making it mean that they're not capable or competent. They're just course correcting. And that's the thing. You know, we have a choice. We can either stay in limbo and just be in that rocking chair or we can step into our power. And that looks like showing up, making a commitment, seeing what feedback the universe gives you and course correcting along the way. Well, as you heard, Ashley's path was certainly not linear. Neither is mine. I talk a lot about that in my book, Imperfect Courage. And by the way, we are doing a giveaway on Instagram of Ashley's book and my book and this really amazing leather tote from Noonday Collection. It's the perfect work bag. And all you got to do is go comment. We just want to get word out about this new series that's out. So head on over there, check it out. I love how Ashley sat down and called 2,000 people. 2,000 people. What tenacity. That truly, truly inspired me. And then she also talked about how we need to tune in to that wish that you hear in your heart. And tuning in to my heart and to that wish is definitely something that was the impetus for starting Noonday Collection. And I would love to invite you along. If you are interested in making a little bit of a U-turn, if you're interested in just trying something new, consider joining us as a Noonday Collection ambassador. Many ambassadors have launched their businesses and it's actually been a catalyzing point for other things that they've been done in their lives. And we are just offering an awesome special right now. So we'd love for you to go head over to NoondayCollection.com or you can always find me on Instagram. I'll answer any questions you have. So we'd love for you to join. Before we go, review and rate the podcast. Our wonderful music for today's show is by my good friend, Ellie Holcomb. Going Scared is produced by Eddie Kohlfoltz. And I'm Jessica Honiger. Until next time, let's take each other by the hand and keep going scared. Going Scared.